You know, I've had thousands of conversations about the future with people all over the world, from taxi drivers to CEOs. And the interesting thing about having all these conversations is the questions that people ask you as a futurist about the future and what these questions reveal about the assumptions they make, the thinking that they do and don't do about the future. So, for instance, one of the most common questions that I get, apart from what the hell is a futurist, is, well, give me your predictions for such and such, or what is the future for so and so? And what I think these questions reveal is a, an assumption that there is a correct answer to these questions, that the future is knowable, and that it is somehow fixed, and that my job or one's job as somebody looking at the future is to try to figure out what the answer to those questions is, as if it's just the hidden part of the thread on a spool that just hasn't un revealed itself yet. And in contrast, I have a great friend in Toronto who's a brilliant physicist, and uh, he asks excellent questions about everything. And we caught up recently, and he said to me, so what is the most powerful idea in this field that you work in, in foresight? What is the most powerful idea in future studies? And I said, well, I think the most powerful idea in foresight is actually its point of departure. It's foresight 101. It's the first thing you learn when you begin to think about this stuff, which is that the future does not exist. It hasn't happened yet. It's not set. It's not predetermined. And therefore, the most useful way to think about it is as a landscape of possibilities. The most powerful idea about foresight, I think, is that futures are plural, not singular. Now, th this idea that futures are plural, not singular, is one that, uh, you know, perhaps it doesn't exactly blow your head off to hear it. When I say that it's powerful, I'm not saying that it's magical. I'm not saying that it completely changes your life to hear these words. It's not what the idea does to you that is significant. It's what you can do with this idea. Because once you begin to look at the futures as an array of possibilities, as a landscape to be navigated as time goes by, you can begin to ask yourself questions. You can begin to scan the environment looking for signals of change, for little seeds of what may come forth and seeds that may, you may decide to water, or weeds you may decide to pull out. You can begin to garden change. You can begin to develop scenarios for alternative possibilities that make intelligible by putting them into a narrative, into a coherent story. This is what one future could look like. And then over here, this is what another could look like. And then you can use those thoughts, those tools for wondering, to ask what if, and make perhaps wiser, more intelligent choices for yourself, for the futures of your community, your company, your country, whatever it might happen to be. Now, the idea that we could be doing a whole lot more with futures than we actually tend to do is not a new one. It goes back quite a long way. And even in the modern era, it's quite surprising how early it is, given how many people uh, I come across who have never heard of the field of futures studies or the idea of a professional futurist. If we go back to no less a figure than H.G. Wells, the seminal science fiction writer who gave the world the Invisible Man, the Time Machine, the War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells went on to BBC Radio in 1932 and said, isn't it remarkable that we have thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people around the world who make a full-time job out of analysing, researching, studying the past, and that there are no people at all who make a full-time job, remember this is in 1932, of thinking about the future. And isn't it clear, Wells said, that we ought to have professors of foresight, and not just one or two, but whole departments dedicated to looking into these things and helping us make more wise decisions in the present? Well, you know, some things have changed since 1932 and others haven't. One thing that's changed is that there now are a handful of programs around the world um, where you can specialise in this stuff. There are professors of foresight, that's my day job as it happens. But there are other things that haven't changed. And what H.G. Wells was calling for when he called for professors of foresight was, I think, in need... Well, to these days it's in need of an update. It's not so much that what we need are batteries of experts studying the future on our behalf to tell us what we should think about it 
and what the dangers are. I mean, he pointed out the example in 1932 of the automobile, right, which was well on its way to transforming the world at that point. And he said, isn't it amazing that we're abolishing distance with this technology, heedlessly, his words, recklessly, and nobody seems to be thinking about what kind of a society it's going to give us. Well, don't we kind of wish that we'd listened to that in 1932 and thought a little bit more about what car culture could become? But regardless of that, what he was calling for, I think, these days is best interpreted as not a, not a culture of expertise about futures, but a social capacity, a civilizational ability, if you like, to think well about futures and to choose more wisely from among them. Isn't that possibly a good idea, that we try to socialize and distribute a capacity like that um, and to, uh, to make it possible to choose more, more wisely by distributing that capacity among uh, all of us? So the way that I try to do that as a, a design professor these days is to blend the infrastructure of futures thinking, if you like, which is quite abstract, taken on its own, with the concreter of designed objects. So my students and collaborators and I design artifacts from the future, experiences that feel like they could be happening 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, so that we're not just thinking about it cognitively and entertaining it as a thought experiment, but trying to feel our way into what these various possibilities might portend and what they might be like to live through for people on the ground so that we can let that inform our decisions today. So with all of that, I have to confess a certain reluctance to play the role of the guru or the oracle, which many people seem to want or expect when they come across a futurist. That is until this week, here at Burning Man, um, two days ago, in fact. Now, I'll tell you the story. What happened was, I, uh, this, this year I'm camping with a bunch of uh, extremely lovely and hospitable Lithuanians. And uh, over there by the man, it's surrounded, as you will have seen, by uh, an array of tents, a souk, right, a bazaar, which is populated with projects from various regions around the country and around the world. So I've been helping the Lithuanians translate this uh, lit classic Lithuanian folktale into an experience that you can have in the souk. It's been a lot of fun, it was great, and I took a break from that on Tuesday afternoon and wandered next door to immediately the next tent over from, uh, from where we were because, lo and behold, there were a bunch of Scandinavians in there, and they're still doing this, um, creating an oracle, a participatory oracle, actually. And so you walk into this tent and you see this enormous face, and it's probably... 10 feet wide and 8 feet high, and it's made of paper mache or, or uh, carbon fiber or something, I'm not sure. And you sit down in front of this huge face, this nose and mouth, and it's, it's the Norse god, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong, Marmo, I think it's, it's pronounced. Mamir, thank you. The, the Norse god Mamir, and you beseech Mamir to shed light on whatever burning questions it is that you carry within you about your future, your past, whatever it is. But of course, it's not just that side. Around the other side is where the oracle, him or herself, actually resides. And so you go around the back and there's this tube. And in the tube is where you hear the questions coming through, from the, through the wall. You can't see the people and they can't see you. And then you answer back in the person, or person is probably not the right word, the character of Nemir, and uh, do your best to instruct them in whatever it is they're asking about. So I popped over there to check this out, and this Swedish guy jumps up and says, oh, we've just got some travelers who have come in. Would you mind being an oracle for a few minutes? And I'm like, uh, well, actually, that sounds like a lot of fun. Sure, yeah, why not? So I sit down and put my ear to this tube, and I'm thinking, you know, this is going to be kind of an amusing interaction, right? People are going to gonna know as well as I do that I'm not a Norse god in a position to give cosmic advice. But the first voice that comes through the tube is that of a man, and he says, O oh, great oracle, will I find love on the playa this year? I'm like, wow, this is way above my pay grade. I have no idea how to answer that one. But before I know what's happening, I'm somehow channeling the rolling stones, and I say, you may not get what you want, but the playa will provide what you need. <laughs> Seem to have 
past the first hurdle of uh, oracular challenge with that one. The next voice that I hear is uh, it's a woman's voice, and she asks another serious question. I'm just like, uh, did we make the right decision in staying in Idaho? Did we make the right decision staying in Idaho? Like, where do you begin with that? But before I know what's happening, the oracle is intoning, it was the right decision at the time. And she repeats this. I can hear this, her repeating this to herself or the person next to her, whatever it is, and, and she goes away apparently satisfied. <laughs> the third voice then comes through, and it's a, it's a different character this time. It's a young man who speaks a little bit haltingly. And I can hear in his voice that this is a, a question of, with serious intent behind it. And he says, what the hell does he say? Um, let me just check what he said. I may be an oracle, but I have a kind of a crappy memory. Oh, of, co of course. What he, he asked the fundamental question that we, all, uh, that we all ask of ourselves. He said, oh, oracle, a halting quality in his voice. He says, just, I, I have a general question. I just want to know something about my future. What can you tell me about my future? he says. And this is the kind of question that I normally run a mile to avoid as a professional futurist, but I'm like, well, you know, I'm an oracle. I've got to step up to the plate here. And so I, I say to the guy, look, I, I didn't say it like that. Um, I'm looking at this tube that's coming out with his voice coming through. And next to it, there's these uh, paintings of N Norse runes, um, you know, uh, symbols. And they're English translations just underneath, underneath them. And the guys who made the installation have put these here to kind of inspire who's, whoever is playing the god at that moment to say, you know, oracular wise things. And my eye falls onto a rune that has two words underneath it. It says destruction and creation. So this is one symbol that actually means both of those things. And so this young guy who says, tell me something about my future. Before I know what's happening, the words are coming out of my mouth. Anyone who asks about the future should know that creation and destruction, growth and loss are two sides of the same coin. And he says, wow, that's a pretty philosophical answer. <laughs> although you, I guess you are a Norse god, thanks. And I can hear him getting up to go. And then these other words come out of me. I say, Traveler, there is a question here for you too. And he says, what is it? This young guy who wants to know the future. And I say, why do you need to know? And he says, he says, honestly, because I'm afraid of uncertainty. And the oracle says back, then the best advice I can give you is to befriend uncertainty. And he says, thank you. I might just do that. And he leaves. These three people came, and it's hard to tell in what measure, seriously or jokingly, but they came in some sense asking these questions about the future, questions that I've heard in different forms many other times, although quite different settings. Questions that bespeak a kind of need for a cosmic reassurance, right? But a, a kind of cosmic reassurance that I don't consider it to be in the power of any flesh and blood person to actually be able to give to someone else. We live in uncertainty and that's that. But I have come to think that the most powerful idea in foresight is not actually an idea. It's a commitment. The most powerful idea in futures studies is the act of deciding to engage it, of gardening change, of engaging an optimism of the will and asking the question, well, what are the other possible answers here? What are the futures that aren't being discussed? And how might I influence them? What can I do today to move things in the direction that I would like to see happen? That's the most powerful idea in futures. And I think maybe it's also the way that we can befriend uncertainty. Thank you.